Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. We're glad you are with us and hope that you're ready for a continued study from God's Word. We're going to be talking about some um, comments that were made on uh, one of the YouTube videos from a while back, but the uh, gentleman has given more information. Uh, after his comment, he gave some more information, and so we're going to be following up on that, and it's going to be, I think, good information that is on a topic that everyone seems to be talking about more and more, and I uh, hope it's going to be beneficial for you, especially if you are in the Methodist Church. You might want to uh, take a special interest to in this because the gentleman <clears throat> revealed to us that he's in the Methodist Church, and so this is what we're going to be stating tonight. But we always want to start off with our content information. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. If you would like to uh, reach me by email, we meet at 250 Boulevard in Eden. And you're welcome to come and visit with us anytime we are assembling, 9 o'clock a.m. on Sundays, 10 a.m. is when we have worship on Sunday, and then Thursdays at 7 p.m. And so we hope that you will come out and take advantage of that. Of course, if you're in the Martinsville area or the Danville area, 120 American Legion Danville and 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville, we'll be glad for you to come out and visit with us uh, anytime that, uh, that you have a chance. Let me get right on into this lesson. Uh, we want to start off with a comment that was that was made. It was in regard to a video that had to do with uh, women uh, uh, preachers. And the title of the lesson, if you want to look it up on uh, YouTube and take a look at that, is the real story about women preachers, and it was from back in 2015. And here is the, the comment that started it all. <clears throat> the gentleman says, his name is uh, uh, Warden Phil. It's just handle there, and he says, I don't want to get into a long theological argument lest I state my denomination's position badly, but I will say this. They have shown reasoning which I find satisfactory to show the legitimacy of female pastors, including a thorough discussion of the particular circumstances behind the verses everyone quotes against female pastors. So I responded, and I asked him what denomination was he, because... You know, if you're going to say they made some good arguments on the on the topic, then I would like to see that. And if they're satisfactory to him, then maybe they'll be satisfactory to me. I mean, uh, you never can tell. That's what we're all trying to do: is reason together from the scriptures to see if the things are so. And so, if you they're if they're satisfactory reasoning from the scriptures for you, then maybe they'll be satisfactory for the rest of us as well. And I can appreciate uh, someone saying, "I don't want to." Uh, try to state the position because I may mis misstate it. That's fine, but let's get it right from from the source. Now, the uh, the next comment that I want to show you, and I, I just thought this was kind of humorous. I know I'm pretty sure he was saying it somewhat humorously. He makes a point that at the in the lesson at 36 uh, 35, uh, I make a statement, and I'm just going to play you the statement and his comment to that, which will bring you to the title of my lesson tonight. Here is what I'm saying on in April 2015 about women preachers. Now don't get mad at me. I didn't write the book. I'm just reading. A woman cannot be a pastor. I don't care how sorry men are. A woman still cannot be a pastor. Okay, so... The rest of the story, well, it can't be because men are sorry. It can't be because you don't have the authority to be one anyway. You can't, you can't say, well, God can call who he wants to. I remember that, well, God can, call, God can call a mule. You know, God spoke by a donkey. Well, there's a lot of people that are just as stubborn as a mule when they say a woman can be a pastor. Now, at that point, at that point, Mr. Phil makes the comment, and he says... Just call me Mr. Mule. Okay, well, Mr. Mule, if you want to be stubborn about it, let's be stubborn about the Bible. I'm just as stubborn about what the Bible says about women not being able to be a pastor as you may be or seem to be about women able to be a pastor. So why, why don't we just go to the Bible and let's see what the Bible is saying and let that decide uh, which one of us is right or what is right, whether one of us is right or wrong. So he made the statement, then he, he replied again, and he says, I am a United Methodist, 
you may look up what they say on our official website. And he gives the link there. You may attend, without obligation, one of our adult confirmation classes, or you may call up your local United Methodist Church. I will not add to anything these sources will provide, but I will say I'm grateful for the many excellent pastors, both male and female, that have crossed my path. I acknowledge that I am not a theological expert. I rely on the expertise of those I have found trustworthy, just like we all do on all the other aspects of life. It takes years of education to become a United Methodist, Methodist pastor. Okay, so he gives, the, he gives a source, and I, I appreciate that. So tonight, we're going to just look at this uh, article, or one of the articles that he listed. I, there were several on the page. This is the one that uh, I chose to go through. That we may go through some others at another time. But it's a commentary of the ordination of women by the Reverend Dr. Steve Harper, Dean Osbury Theological Seminary, Orlando. And so I've just taught this right from the mule's mouth. So someone is stubborn enough to say, well, this is what I'm, uh, just call me Mr. Mule. I'm stubborn enough to say the women can be pastors from the Bible. So we'll go right to the source, get it right instead of from the horse's mouth. We're going to get it right from the mule's mouth. And let's find out what the, the uh, uh, United Methodist Church teaches on the ordination of women based upon this article that uh, Mr. Phil Sides as authority that was that convinced him, that convinced him that women can be pastors. Let's just start off by reading some of the article. <clears throat> now I hope you can read this. <clears throat> uh, it says, first of all, the creation narrative shows a shared dominion where both men and women are commissioned by God to care for the world, the family, etc. Second, the Old Testament period included. Significant ministry from such women as Esther and Deborah. Third, it is also clear that Jesus included women in his apostolic community. Now, friends, here is the problem just from the very outset. No one is saying women cannot be ministers in some degree. But the problem arises when people try to lump women being ministers into one aspect of ministry. Just because, just because preaching is ministering does not mean that women then can be preachers. They may can minister and they, in various aspects. They may have been used in various aspects by God, but that does not mean that then they can be pastors, that they can be preachers. So just because a woman served in one way doesn't mean in every way. Now surely we can understand that. You cannot read into the text or into the Bible what is not there. Just because a woman did something doesn't mean that a woman can do everything. Just like, just like with the Levites, for example. Caleb was talking about the sacrifices. Levites, the priests, all came from the tribe of Levi. But just because you came from the tribe of Levi, that does not mean that you were a priest. Every priest was a Levite, but every Levite was not a priest. And some women may have ministered, but that doesn't mean that women then can be pastors. See, that's, that's where the, the fallacy comes in uh, right from the beginning. But let's go on. The article goes on to say, A turning point occurs in Acts 2 verse 17, when the prophecy of Joel is fulfilled, including the fact that, quote, your daughters shall prophesy. The Greek word for prophecy is broader than the role of prophet and is used to speak in general communication of the global message. Even those who argue against the ordination of women have acknowledged that the Pentecostal uh, uh, para, paradigm creates a new context for the ministry of women in the Christian church. I, I don't have to acknowledge that. I understand what Peter was saying when he quoted Joel about the women prophesying. Uh, I'm going to get to this moment. Let's read another excerpt here. He says, in the congregational era of the New Testament, we see the ministry of women further reinforced by such people as Philip's daughters, Acts 21, 9, Priscilla, Romans 16, 5, and Junia, Romans 16, 7. In the case of Junia, she is referred as prominent among the apostles. But was she an apostle? Is that what that means? No. Just because someone is well known among the apostles doesn't mean that they are an apostle. Just because there's someone is well known among a group of people does not make them then a pastor or something that they're not. 
giving credence to their leadership role given uh, some women, at least, had in the early church. No, that doesn't mean they had a leadership role just because they were known among people. Listen, you can, you can be a groupie. You can be following the, the rock and roll band and they may all know you. That doesn't mean you're part of the band, does it? These people that hang out uh, behind, backstage or want to be backstage, does that make them part of the band? No. These people that tailgate out in the, in the parking lot before ball games and they like to get all the autographs of all the players, does that mean because all the players know them, does that mean they're one of the players, don't part of the team? No. Just because women are named and as cited as being uh, well known in certain circles does not mean then that they are ministers. But let's listen to what, what he says. Near to the close of the New Testament era, we also see the emergence of deaconesses. Now, friends, uh, 1 Timothy 3.11, we're really going to take some time to look at this. First of all, let's notice this. In Acts 2 and verse 17, Acts 2 and verse 17, we read Peter quoting uh, Joel. Let's just read this. Acts 2 verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Now, if we just stopped right here and read your daughters shall prophesy, then you might very well think, well, that means women can preach. But friends, here is a, here's a principle that you have to follow when you're studying the Bible. Here's a principle of interpretation, that is a principle that you follow to get the real meaning of the Bible, to get out of it what God put in it. And that is the scripture cannot be broken. John 10, 34 uh, through 36. The scripture cannot contradict itself. So if we take this one verse and that's all we look at, then we may very well think that women can be preachers. But listen, it is written again. The same principle that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 4 when he's being tempted by the devil, and the devil comes and quotes scripture to him, Jesus turned around and said, it is written again. Well, we have to do the same thing with Acts 2 verse 17. It is written again. There are other passages, there are other passages that are going to qualify or help us understand what is meant in Acts 2 verse 17 where it says your daughter shall prophesy. See, we have to look at the rest of the verses. If daughters prophesying meant that they were preaching and teaching and usurping authority over men, that they were being pastors <coughs> and preachers in the early church, then we have to see that it doesn't contradict anywhere else. But yet it does. Yet it does. Let's look in Acts 21, which was cited by the, uh, the Reverend Dr. whatever his name was, about women preaching, ordination of women. Of women. Notice this, in Acts 21, verse 8. And the next day, we were of Paul's company, we of Paul's company departed, and came into Caesarea, and we entered to the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Now what about Philip? Look at verse 9. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Alright? Now, if we stop there, we might say, well, there you go. They're prophesying, so therefore women can be pastors. Women can be preachers. No, friends. No, friends, that's not the case. Notice this. In verse 10, verse 10, And we tarried there many days. There came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. A certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was coming to us, he took Paul's uh, girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus said the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews uh, at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall, <clears throat> and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, here's the question. Here's what we've got to do a little reasoning together. If your daughter's prophesying and Philip having four daughters that prophesy, if that is the qualifications or if that is the authority for women pastors, women preachers, and usurping authority over men, then why is it that Agabus had to come down? Why couldn't these four women prophesy to Paul? Why couldn't they teach Paul? Why couldn't they give the revelation to Paul? 
Why did they need a man to come down? Why did God send a man prophet to come down when there were four women who could prophesy right there? I'll tell you why. Because it is written again that a woman cannot teach nor usurp authority over a man. See how easy that is? So yes, they might can prophesy. Yes, they might can teach. And certainly they could if they had to get the prophecy. But it wasn't in the capacity that the United Methodist Church is trying to set forth in this article. It just doesn't happen. It's written again, you see? So it's not to say that women couldn't have uh, uh, the ability to do some of these things, because clearly they did. God said they would, and then we have Philip having uh, four daughters that did. <clears throat> but they didn't do it in the same capacity as we're led to believe. Now let's go on again. He mentioned deaconesses. He mentioned the fact that uh, in this article, he said, near to the close of the, of the New Testament era, we also see the emergence of deaconesses, 1 Timothy 3.11. I want you to consider this. Friends, the word deacon simply means a servant. Now, when I read Romans 16, Romans 16 and verse 1, where Paul writes, I commend unto you Phoebe our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea. When I read that and I see that Phoebe is a servant, and then I read about some of these other women that we are told are deaconesses or some kind of uh, official capacity, when I read through there, then I have to stop and say, well, what, what does the word servant mean? What is a deacon? See, because the word servant, which is translated deacon, does not mean that these women were deaconesses or servants in the same capacity as 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11. See, let me show you. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11, how do I know that? Well, let's go back to our, our rule. It's written again. It's written again. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11, let's read that. 1 Timothy 3, 11, which is the verse that was cited. It said, Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Friends, that doesn't say anything about a woman being a deacon. It doesn't say anything about a woman being a deaconess. That's talking about the wives of a deacon. Let's look at verse 8. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. Likewise, likewise, uh, must deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let, them, let these also first be proved. Let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives. Now friends, these cannot be women. These are men because they have wives. See that? Let their wives be grave, not slender, sober, faithful, and all things. Here's some qualifications for deacons' wives. Not to be deacons, but in order to be the wife of a deacon. Let the deacons, verse 12, let the deacons be uh, the husbands of one wife. Now friends, a woman cannot be a deacon in this capacity. She cannot be a servant in this capacity. Because she cannot meet the qualifications of a deacon. So don't tell me that there were deaconesses in the early church, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11. That's not the case. Deacons were to be the husbands of one wife. And women cannot be deacons. Just like they can't be pastors. The same verse. I don't understand this. I don't understand how anybody can say, well, the Bible authorizes women to be pastors and women to be deacons on 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 12. No. As a matter of fact, that text actually says they cannot be pastors or deacons by looking at the text. Notice this. Let's just go back. This should be cut and dry. Uh, let's go all the way back to the top. 1 Timothy 3, and verse 1. This is a true saying of a man be the desire the office of a bishop. He desires a good work. A bishop, friends, is the same as a pastor. Do we need to go over this again? The, a bishop is the same as a pastor, same as an elder, same as a presbyter, same as an overseer. Acts 20, Acts 20, the Apostle Paul wrote to the, uh, 
wrote to the elders of Ephesus. Look at verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. What did he say to them? The elders of the church. He tells them in verse 28. He said, Take heed therefore in yourselves unto the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. That's the same word as bishop. To feed the church of God. To feed. That's the, uh, that's the verb of the word pastor. So to pastor the church of God which he had purchased his own blood. So elders are the same as bishops and their job is to pastor. And a woman cannot be a pastor because a bishop or an elder or an overseer or a pastor is supposed to be the husband of one wife. A bishop, an elder, an overseer, a pastor then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. There's no way in God's green earth there's no way that a woman can be a pastor. She cannot be the husband of one wife. Now that ought to end it right there. Why is someone going to be so mule-headed and say, well, a woman can be a pastor when it says clearly right here that a woman, uh, that a pastor is the husband of one wife. Now I get, I understand, Methodists are bringing in the, the homosexuals. They want the lesbians to come in. But friends, even then, you're still not changing this. You're still not changing the husband is, the husband of one wife, to make a woman a pastor. And the same text, as we've already showed, the same text talks about deacons in an official capacity, and it says the deacon must be grave, not double-tongued, not giving him much wine, not greedy, filthy lucre, and his wife must be grave. It doesn't say the deacon, a deaconess, but a deacon's wife. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Again, it is impossible for a deacon or a pastor to be the husband of one wife. Friends, that ought to stop it right there. Now, if someone's really interested in the truth and they think that a woman can be a deacon or a pastor, they should read this verse. No, they can't. Not in this capacity they can't. Don't use this verse to justify a woman being a, a, a deacon. It just won't work. It won't work. You need to try to find another verse. You won't find it. All right? You won't find it, but you can try. Now, let's get back to that word deacon. That word deacon, friends, simply means a servant. It simply means someone who is a servant. In this capacity, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it is an official capacity that has quali certain qualifications to be called a deacon. Friends, but that is why the word that's translated deacon in 1 Timothy 3 is not translated deacon in other places. So that it's not confused. But generally speaking, a deacon is just a servant. Now, if you want to say, well, a deacon's a servant. A deacon's a servant, so anywhere I find that word deacon, or anywhere I find that word servant, I'm going to be, I'm going to say deacon. So if I find a woman that's called a servant, I'm going to call her a deacon. Okay. If you're sure you want to do that. Everywhere you find the word that's translated deacon, or that's translated uh, deacon in 1 Timothy 3, everywhere you find it, you're going to translate it deacon in other places? Okay. But you're going to be in for a, a really funny uh, time here because that word translated deacon is translated servant, it's translated minister. And if you're going to make it deacon everywhere you find it, here's what you're going to come up with. Let's look at Romans Let's look at Romans 13. Romans chapter 13. Listen to what the Bible says. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinances of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a, are not a terror to good works, but to the, to the evil. Wilt thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Here it is. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. Same word, servant. Same word, deacon. So let's just put deacon here. He is the deacon of God to thee for good. So the powers that be, the, the rulers, rulers are deacons of God? Boy, think about that now, friends. 
Think about what you're saying. If you're going to say rulers are ministers, or rulers are deacons, you're going to have Deacon Trump. President Trump, deacon. Now you're going to call him deacon? He's a deacon. He's a deacon. He's a minister. He's a ruler. Ordained by God. And the Bible says that the rulers are the ministers of God. So let's just change that word to deacon. So we've got Deacon Trump here. Deacon Trump lives in the White House. See? Remember, remember, a deacon has to be the husband of one wife. So let's look at this. In Romans 15 and verse 8. I'm trying to show you how if you take this to mean deacon in the sense of 1 Timothy 3, verse 8, then you're going to have Jesus being married. Now look at this. In, in Romans 15 and verse 8. Now I say that Jesus was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto their fathers. Now here, Jesus is called a deacon, a minister. Let's put that deacon there. Now is that the same kind of deacon as we're talking about in 1 Timothy 3, 8? Is that the same kind of deacon as we're talking about in Romans uh, uh, Romans 13? Is minister in Romans 13 the same kind of deacon in 1 Timothy 3? Is Romans 15 here, Jesus is a deacon? Is, he, is that the same kind of deacon as in 1 Timothy 3? The deacon in 1 Timothy 3 had to be the husband of one wife. Was Jesus married? You say, well, James, that's not the same kind of deacon. Thank you. And that's why when a woman is called a servant, she is not a deacon in the same capacity as 1 Timothy 3. You cannot use 1 Timothy 3 to say women can be deacons. You can't use that term. You can't use it in the same capacity. What about this? Let's look at one more. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. Listen to what Paul says. Paul said, Who also hath made us able deacons of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the, uh, of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Let's look, at, let's look at one more. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 4. Paul says, But in all things approving ourselves as the deacons of God, in much patience, in, the, in afflictions, in necessities and distresses. Do you mean to tell me that deacon here is, is the same kind of deacon or deacon in the same capacity as in 1 Timothy 3? 1 Timothy 3, the deacon had to be the husband of one wife. Was Paul married? Paul wasn't married. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul said, I wish that all men were like me. That is not married. He's talking to the unmarried individuals. He said, I wish that all men were like me. So, was Paul married? No. How could he be a deacon? Well, you, well James, see, he's, he's, he's a deacon in a different capacity than that of 1 Timothy 3. Thank you very much. So why then do you want to use 1 Timothy 3 to say a woman can be a deacon? See that? She may be a servant. She may minister in some ways, but she's not a deacon in the sense of 1 Timothy 3. Come on, people. Let's don't be mule-headed about this. Let's don't be stubborn. All right? Let's take the Bible and let's look at the Scriptures and let's see that a woman cannot be a deacon. Now, friends, if you're going to be honest, you're going to say, you know what, we can't... You're trying to make women be pastors. You're trying to make women be deaconesses. You're trying to make women be in a, some kind of capacity of ministry that the Bible doesn't condemn, you cannot, or that the Bible doesn't talk about, you cannot use 1 Timothy 3. You've got to go somewhere else. If you can, if you can, but I don't, you're not going to find it. All right, so I want you to see from these verses that just because a word is translated deacon in 1 Timothy 3, not the same capacity. All right, let's, let's move on. Let's look at some more of this article. Furthermore, it must also be remembered that ordination, now, whoo, you get ready. Get ready for this. This is going to blow it out of the water. Furthermore, it must also be remembered that ordination, as we understand it in the United Methodism, today does not have exact roots in the New Testament. A contemporary theology of ordination cannot be read back into the biblical text, but the text can be instructive uh, as it is 
reveals the ministry of women in the early church, it is also beyond question. All right, let's stop right there. Read that again. It must be remembered that ordination, as we understand it in the United Methodism, today does not have exact roots in the New Testament. Why are we even going to go any further? We ought to just stop right there. We can take phone calls the rest of the night on whatever topic. Because, hey, why are we trying to defend the United Methodist position on women pastors, women preachers, women being ordained for a certain part of a ministry when they're actually admitting that United Methodism doesn't even have exact roots in the Bible? That sounds like something that came from the devil's deacons. 2 Timothy 11 verse 5. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 5. Look at this. I suppose that I was not whipped behind the very uh, chiefest apostles. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 11. Uh, let's come on down here. We're looking at verse... Uh, uh, should be 15. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his... Ministers, there's that word deacon again, also be transformed as the deacons of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So the devil has some deacons. Well, friends, I believe that's exactly what we're talking about right here. A doctrine that is trying to justify something by the Bible that the Bible doesn't talk about. Someone is teaching something that's not in the Bible, and they're saying, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's in the Bible. I'm convinced it's in the Bible. I've been told it's in the Bible. And the very, the very text, the very uh, article that the man says convinced him that women can be passionate preachers actually admits it doesn't even have roots. The exact roots in the New Testament. Friends, why would you even want to believe that? Why would you want to believe that? Let's go on. Let's look at another one. It says, furthermore, uh, a contemporary theology of ordination cannot be read back in to the biblical text. But you're sure trying. But the text can be instructive to us today as it reveals the ministry of women in the early church. Again, friends, a contemporary theology of ordination cannot be read into the biblical text. If you can't find what you're doing in the Bible, then reading it back into the text is exactly what you're doing. Friends, that's, I'm just, I don't know what to think about this. When I read this, I thought, what kind of proof is this? What kind of confession is this? Where people are saying, well, what we're doing, what we believe is not in the biblical text, doesn't have root in the biblical text, and what we're trying to do, you can't read it back into the biblical text. But if you can't read it from the biblical text, why are you telling us it is true? For crying out loud, people, are we really going to be that mule-headed? We're going to be that mule-headed to say, well, I'm convinced, I'm convinced by all these people that yes, it's true, and yet those people that, you're, that have convinced you are admitting it's not in the biblical text. I, I just don't understand that. I, I just don't understand why someone would say, I'm convinced by it. When I read that, it convinced me more thoroughly that what was being said about women pastors and women preachers is not true. It convinced me more thoroughly that what, what the Bible teaches is right and that this idea of women pastors, women preachers, women deacons, whatever, it, it's, it's not from the Bible. It's not from God. When someone admits it, I mean, what else do you do? What else do you do? Now, again, no one is saying that women were not involved in ministering. No one's saying that friends. Look, I'll admit, women were involved in ministering. 
All right, in, in Mark 15, Mark 15 and verse 40. Look at this. There were also women looking on afar off. This is when Christ was hanging on the cross. Among whom was Mary Magdalene and the mother, and Mary the mother of James, <clears throat> the less, and of Joseph, and Salome, who also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered unto him. And many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. No doubt about it, they ministered to him. No, about, no doubt about it, they cared for uh, <clears throat> his physical needs like food. and I'm sure maybe, uh, you know, give him a place to stay. We know he, he stayed with Mary and Martha and Lazarus in Bethany. So no doubt about it, they were ministering to those that were with Christ. Obviously providing food and things like that necessary for their continuing on their ministry. But that doesn't make them preachers. So no one is saying that they didn't minister. Yes, they ministered in the sense of they, they, they helped. They were servants in that capacity. Look at Acts uh, 16. Acts 16 to verse 14. Here's Lydia. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard those things which uh, uh, worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened when she attended to the things which were spoken of by Paul, and when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there, and she constrained us. She was ministering to them. Does that mean she's a deacon? Not in the sense of 1 Timothy 3. Does that mean she's a pastor? No, not in the sense of 1 Timothy 3. Does that mean she is a a minister in the sense of she's up preaching and teaching in front of uh, in front of men? No. It just means she's a servant. It just means she is she is a servant. Alright? So no one is saying, no one is saying that women weren't involved in ministering. But they just weren't in the same way that the Methodist is teaching. They just weren't in the same way that this, this article that we're going through is trying to profess. Trying to defend. Then he says, it is also beyond question that by the 4th century, women were ordained to ministry in the church. And this would never have happened if the original proponents had felt it were a violation to the Bible. I, I feel like this is some kind of sarcasm here. I feel like maybe in the modern vernacular there should be an LOL there, right? Laugh out loud. <laughs> That's what it makes me want to do. Listen, it is beyond question that by the 4th century women were ordained to ministry in the church. And this would never happen if people thought it was violated to the Bible. Really? You mean to tell me that no one would do this contrary to the Bible? You mean to tell me that that if someone thought it was contrary to the Bible, it would have happened? Friend, where do you think the Catholic Church came from? Don't you think someone's going to come along and say, well, you know what, I know the Catholic Church is right because the people who started the Catholic Church, they never would have done it. You know, if they had felt it were in violation to the Bible. Friends, people do things all the time that are contrary to the Bible and they'll turn around and say, well, I don't believe it's wrong. I don't believe it's contrary to the Bible. There are congregations of the churches of Christ that will come along and say, yeah, we're going to use women preachers or we're going to introduce instrumental music. You know why? Because we've studied it and we don't think it's contrary to the Bible. Well, friends, what you think is contrary to the Bible or not contrary to the Bible doesn't mean that it's not. And do you think, do you think someone's going to come along and admit that, well, yeah, this is, this is contrary to the Bible. This is a violation to the Bible. Oh, wait. They just did admit it. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? Oh, well, this wouldn't have happened if people felt it was a violation of the Bible. Well, excuse me, but I think you just admitted right here that 
the or theology, theology of ordination cannot be read back into the Bible. And I think you just told me, I think you just stated that uh, we need to understand that ordination as we understand it in the United Methodism today does not have re exact roots in the New Testament. And then you want to come along and tell us, expect us to believe that someone wouldn't do something if they felt it was in violation to the Bible? That's exactly what was just admitted to us. I mean, it just makes you want to do a face palm, don't it? I, I, can't, I can't believe what I'm reading here. And this is the defense for women pastors? This is the defense from the, from the Reverend Dr. Somebody from the theology of something, Osberg, whatever? That's your, that's your defense? We can't trace it back to the Bible. We can't read it back into the Bible. But we never would do it if it was contrary to the Bible. I, somebody help me out. Am I missing something here? I mean, it's just ignorance going to seed. I, I, I can't believe someone would write that. Yeah, friends, if it's not in the Bible, and you're admitting it's not in the Bible, then yeah, it's contrary to the Bible. It's a violation of the Bible. <clears throat> when someone just tells me, well, we're doing something that they can't find in the Bible, but we never would do it if we thought it was contrary to the Bible. But if you can't find the Bible, friends, don't you think just one little iota, one little smidgen of a smackling of suspicion that maybe it is in violation of the Bible? But we can't find the Bible. But we don't feel it's contrary to the Bible. Well, friends, if you can't find authority in the Bible for what you're doing, you know what? The best thing for you to do is not do it because it's probably going to be contrary to the Bible. <clears throat> then they make this statement. Salvation is for all. Baptism is for all. Discipleship is for all. This being so, it's logical to believe that this paradigm continues to the point that ministry is for all. It does not make sense to believe that God would involve both men and women in the first three elements of a redemptive process and then exclude them from the fourth one. Friends, no one said women were excluded from ministry. But you can't take ministry and make it be preaching and teaching. You have to understand that there are different aspects of ministry. There are different things that a woman can do. There are different things that a woman can uh, participate in. But preaching and teaching over man is not one of them. No one is saying women can't be involved in ministry. But they just can't be involved in preaching, teaching, or usurping authority over man. Now you say, well James, you say a woman can't teach? No, I didn't say that. Look at this. Let's look at this. In Titus chapter 2. Notice this, verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in, be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers, not giving them much wine, teachers of good, teachers of good things, yes, women can teach, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God should not be blasphemed. You mean a woman can teach? Yes, and then the Bible tells us exactly who they can teach. But for some reason, when we read Titus 2 and verse 4, where it says that the aged women should teach the younger women, oh, that's not good enough. That's not clear enough. But when we come to a verse like 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, where Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor exert authority over a man, oh, well, that, that doesn't mean that she can't teach over a man. Friends, this is just as clear when Paul says a woman cannot teach nor usurp authority over man, as it is when he says that a woman can teach the younger women. The Bible is clear on who she can teach and who she can't teach. But for some reason, some reason, people want to be mule headed and say, well, I just don't see that. Listen, just because a woman is not a part of a certain aspect of ministering that is preaching all right and when I say preaching I'm talking about preaching like up front in front of the whole assembly men and women I'm not I'm not saying she can't teach women she can get up and preach to women all she wants to 
But she can't teach nor show authority over man. But just because a woman can't be involved in all aspects of a ministry does not mean that she's excluded from everything. Use this illustration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 14. The body is not one member of many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not part of the body. Is it therefore not part of the body? We understand this idea. Look, our bodies have different functions. But look, my hand cannot be my eyes. My hand cannot be my nose. My hand cannot be my ears. My hand cannot be my feet. See? But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a purpose or a function within the body. A woman... A woman cannot teach, preach, or usurp authority over man, but that does not mean that she can't teach, period. It's just telling who she can't preach and teach over. Now here's what, here's what the article says. The point for us in the Corinthian text is that it simply does not address the issue of women in leadership, much less ordination. It is not a text that apply, even applies to the topic in question, because it refers only to what women should do in the audience. Nothing is said of what they may or may not do up front. That's exactly what is said. What they may and may not do up front. Listen, if you want to talk about ordination, and I guess that's what they mean by preaching, but notice this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, <clears throat> in verse 34, this is that difficult text that they're talking about. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted to them to speak. But they are commanded to be in the silent, uh, to be under obedience, as also saith the law. My friends, there's no way, and in, in this context, Paul's talking about in the assembly, in the church, when the church is all come together in one place, not talking about the building, but when they're coming together in the assembly, it's not permitted for them to speak. They should keep silent. My friends, I don't see how you get around that. There's no way a woman can preach. All right? There's no way a woman can preach to the assembly and at the same time be silent. But I guess, you know, if you're mule headed, you just overlook that. He says nothing said. Well, actually, something is said. Something is said exactly what can and cannot be done. Can she teach? Yes. We just read that. Titus 2, verse 5, 4 and 5. Can she preach? Yes. Titus 2, verse 4 and 5. She preached to women all she wants to. Can she not do something? Yes. She cannot teach nor usurp authority over the man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 12. I don't know why it is that some people think when you say a woman can't preach or be a pastor or be a deacon, that you're saying they, they don't have anything to do in the church. Is that how you reason, friends? Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to your self authority over a man. To teach over a man or to take the authority over a man. But to be in silence. And then here's his reasoning. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was in the transgression. Now here's the rule. Here's the precedent. I didn't make the rules. God made the rules. I didn't write the book. God wrote the book. All right? He goes on to say, I'm trying to hurry. I've got five minutes left. <clears throat> it's an old... Uh, <clears throat> He's talking about 1 Timothy 2.12. He says, however... It is wrong to make this blanket statement for to do so would cause Paul to contradict himself. Friends, Paul didn't contradict himself. And the people making a blank statement are the ones going, well, if a woman can minister, then she can do everything. No, she can't. She can't. You know what? There's some things men can't do in the church. You ever think about that? Did you ever stop and think that 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, actually limits some men as well. No one wants to talk about that. I thought we offer equality here. The same verses that limit elders and deacons to be certain men that meet certain qualities 
qualifications, it also limits other men. If a man is not the husband of one wife, he cannot be an elder. He cannot be a deacon. See that? No, no, but no one complains about that. No, oh, well, you know, we got all equality. If a man's not married, that's what? He's not qualified to be an elder. But no one makes a fuss about that. No one makes a fuss about that. This man says, he says, 1 Corinthians 11, 5, Paul spoke approvingly of women ministering publicly, not in the capacity of preaching. Ministering publicly could be serving food. Ministering publicly could be teaching the kids. Ministering publicly can be a lot of things, but not anything that violates 1 Timothy 2, verse 12, and 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. He committed Euodia and Syntyche for their labor in the gospel. Philippians 4, 3. Look at this. Let's look at Philippians 4, 3. Philippians 4, 3. Now, friends, I want you to see how, how dishonest this is. Philippians 4, 3. I entreat them also, the also true yoke fellow, help those, these, those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and with mother fellow laborers. And he, talks, he, he calls them Euodia and Syntyche. And there are women who labored with him in the gospel. Friends, now you have to read into that to say that they were preaching with Paul. You have to read into it to say, well, they were up there preaching. When Paul just said, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to authority over a man. Let the women keep silence in the churches. Oh, but you know what? You need to help these two women who were out here preaching and teaching and usurping authority over a man. What? That is what make, makes uh, Paul a con uh, Contradicting himself. Where is it? Where do you get <clears throat> that ministering publicly is preaching? And where do you get that women preaching in Philippians 4 3? It's not there, friends. It's just not there. He says, So what Paul resisted was a woman running ahead of the development of the church that in that time. Presuming a role of authority not yet universalized in the body of Christ. Friends, Paul never envisioned a woman in the capacity that is being espoused here in this article by the United Methodist Church. <clears throat> he never envisioned a woman preaching, women deacons, because he wrote contrary to that. He gave, a, he gave qualifications for deacons, the husband of one wife. He gave qualifications for pastors, the husband of one wife. He gave qualifications for, for women and their roles. So it wasn't like he was thinking, well, I'm going to give these now, and later on it's going to change. Friends, what Paul gave were the commandments of God, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. And if Paul expected them to change later on, he wouldn't have given rules that it would be, be conflicting. He wouldn't be saying 1 Timothy 2, and verse 12, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor you serve authority over a man, if later on down the line they were going to be allowed to do that. Furthermore, Paul said in Acts 20, Acts 20 and verse 20, he said, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, from house to house. And then verse 20, <clears throat> uh, se uh, 7, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Funny how if Paul gave all the counsel of God in his preaching and teaching, how in order to justify women preachers, you have to say, well, Paul's looking down the road as something that later might happen one day on down the road. No, friends, not there. Friends, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. But here's what we know. Here's what we know. The Bible's clear on the role of women. Not that they can't teach. It's just that they're limited in what they can teach or who they can teach. Now friends, that's not putting, putting women down. That's just using authority to find out what their role is. I'm out of time. If you'd like to contact me, here's my number 276-340-2653. Thanks for watching. Hope this helps. Until next time, make sure you're always getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.